Good evening for this uh, last section of the festival, Spectres of Communism, here at Haus der Kunst. Again, thank you very much for Haus der Kunst and Damien Lentini for putting this uh, all together, and uh, thanks to all the participants, speakers, and discussants. Um, this morning in this uh, section about questions of political economy, political strategy, and ideology, we were mainly discussing about general concepts and problems of social, radical or emancipatory social transformation um, in terms of uh, both socialist, feminist, and radical cultural um, models of um, working political act activism and um, intellectual constructions of strategies. And I think we had uh, quite quite dense uh, discussions and dense uh, programs and uh, papers we heard. And now we will focus not entirely but mainly on uh, one, of course, one of the main uh, characteristic issues of the classical socialist debate, which is the problem of property, um, and discuss the problem if uh, what is the main problem of the so called uh, private property or uh, pr uh, pr private property of the means of production. So, what, what is the issue, and both in terms of theoretical legitimate constructions of concepts concept itself of property, because one proposition this morning of uh, Friederike Habermann was to distinguish um, between um, property and possession as two distinct juridical and political and economic entities. And so now we will hear other reflections around this uh, topic, and I think it's going to be also very controversial between the two speakers and probably also between the speakers and the public in our discussions to which uh, I look forward. Um, so I, I'm going to present the first speaker, which is David Elliman. <coughs> David Elliman has uh, mainly taught economics, but uh, if you go on his website, you can also see that he's a mathematician. Uh, so he's kind of a very interesting interdisciplinary worker. And uh, the interesting thing about his website is that mostly, as also in things that Friederike Habermann suggested, that it's very much concerned about open source and free e access to information. So you can download a lot of text and information there. So David Elliman has written uh, a lot about the theory and practice of worker cooperatives and other forms of workplace democracy for the past uh, decades. In the realm of theory he developed, and this is what he's partly going to uh, do also tonight, this evening, he developed the modern treatment of the labor theory of property, which is in quotations marked, labor's claim to the whole product of industry. And the associated theory of inalienable rights that imply the neo-abolitionist call for the abolition of wage labor. This is in contrast, and I think this is going to be one controversy in the debates that we're going to have afterwards. This is in contrast to the more traditional Marxist call for the socialization, which is, in fact, has been mostly nationalization of the employment relation, as seen in the book that uh, David published, Property and Contract in Economics, the Case for Economic Democracy. In the realm of practice, so I mentioned this this morning, according to the film title of Claudia von Alemann, Es kommt darauf an, sie zu verändern. So the famous Feuerbach thesis, uh, the philosopher, philosophers have only interpreted the world in a different way. The task is to trans also transform it. So the task is to transform it. So the, we all discuss under the kind of sail under the flag of the unity of theory and practice, I think, today. So in the realm of practice, he co-founded the NGO, the Industrial Cooperative Association, in the late 70s, which adapted the Mondragon model of a worker cooperative to the American legal system. In the early 90s, he was the founder and president of Employees Ownership Services, um, for instance, in Ljubljana, which helped private social ownership to worker 
ownership. And this is, uh, you can read this in the book, The Democratic Worker on Firm. Prior to retirement, he fought, he fought uh, the World Bank from within or from the inside, as you could say, finishing as speechwriter and senior advisor to Josef Stieglitz when he was chief economist. Um, traces of this activity uh, can be found in the book Helping People Help Themselves from the World Bank to an Alternative Philosophy of Development Assistance. So and there he called uh, for the World Bank to be wound up. And so uh, this is uh, basically the, what, uh, to give you a slight suggestion of uh, what David Ellerman has been doing during the last decade. So in the talk, the talk is called Neo-Abolitionism Towards Abolishing the Institution of Renting Persons. You can find in this folder, I think there are still some of them, you can find the whole, the whole abstracts of all the talks. I think this is quite useful, so you can, you can read this. Just to give a slight indication what uh, the talk is about, and David's going to explain it more uh, precisely. Uh, so the uh, question is the employer-employee relationship, so the famous split between capital and labor. So this is what we're going to discuss this evening. It's usually described by various euphemisms such as hiring, employing, giving a job, etc. But from an economic viewpoint, he argues, it is the renting of a person, similar, which is in fact similar to renting a car, a house, or whatever object. So the old, so, so the point is, in his view, the old capitalism socialism debate fundamentally misformulated the question as private employment versus public employment. Just as abolitionism attacked the institution of owning humans itself, the neo-abolitionist position attacks the human rental system itself, regardless of whether the employer is private or a government. So I think I don't read the whole summary, so I rather let uh, David explain himself what he's going to uh, show to us. And so I wish, uh, wish us all an intense uh, discussion um, David's going to give his paper, and then we go immediately to the paper of Raoul Selig, and then we have a general discussion uh, on the two papers together because they kind of are linked, intertwined within each other. Thank you very much, David. Hello, is this on? Okay. Uh, thank you, Michael and Damien and the Haus der Kunst for this invitation. It's a unique opportunity for me. And uh, I wanted to just begin by uh, sort of elaborating on the title of the talk that Michael said a few things about it. Uh, we used to have the system of slavery where workers were owned and the slave owners themselves, the more intelligent ones, uh, made the point that what we really want to own is their labor, that we don't care to own their souls or anything else, we want a guaranteed supply of labor, which we can't get without this slavery system, at least in the Americas. And uh, it was eventually abolished, and the important thing was that it was abol abolished as a voluntary system, that you cannot sell yourself into slavery anymore. And, uh, but what was substituted for it was the voluntary rental system. And so you have to think, well, what's the difference between a rental system and a ownership system? You rent a car, or you, you own a car, you rent an apartment, or you own an apartment. And the basic difference is the, uh, from the economic point of view, is when you rent something, you only buy a small segment of the services that the entity can provide. And whereas when you own it, you own the complete set of future services that it can provide. So that's the fundamental difference. And, and uh, so my calling at the rental system is trying to sort of jar people out of this uh, language uh, barrier they have. In America, we say we hire people, but we rent cars. And yet, if you just go to England, just look at the British version of uh, car rental, it's called a hire car in England. So the word hiring is used both for cars and, and humans in England. So calling it the rental system isn't a accusation. It's not something that's contested. And uh, my slide thing is working, yes. Uh, it is, it is, uh, uh, off a little bit. 
it is something that is agreed to by the uh, economics profession. And uh, so the quote I give you there is from Paul Samuelson, the, the, the um, premier neoclassical economist of, of his time, the first American to win the Nobel Pri so-called Nobel Prize in economics. And uh, he says quite clearly, since slavery was abolished, human earning power is forbidden by law to be capitalized. In other words, you can't sell it all at once. A man is not even free to sell himself, he must rent himself at a wage. And so the emphasis there on rent is also uh, in Samuelson's original. Uh, this recognition in the economic literature is not unique uh, to Sam Samuelson. Uh, here is another quote from a uh, economics book used in Europe, uh, which is actually a revision of a book used in America, uh, which makes the same point there. I won't uh, read it f uh, to you except to note that the second author there is Stanley Fisher. And Stanley Fisher uh, was chief economist of the World Bank. He was a professor at MIT along with Samuelson. And uh, after the World Bank, he went and became the number two person at the IMF, and, and, uh, which is the highest an American can go at the IMF. Then he became the head of the Israeli Central Bank for a few years, and now he's the number two person in the American uh, Federal Reserve Bank. So he's had a stellar career, and so he's, this is not some statement by a marginal economist. This is from Stanley Fisher himself. So uh, that's just to justify the sort of terminology I'm using about renting human beings. Now, let's start to analyze the relationship a little bit of human rentals. And uh, the simple fact is, which we could talk about from various angles, but that the people who work uh, in an enterprise, the employees and any working uh, employer, are de facto, are factually responsible. And this is the word responsibility. When you say a person is responsible for a crime or is not responsible for a crime, you mean you're looking to the past. You're not looking to their role responsibilities in an organizational role. You're saying, you know, who was responsible for doing this, for committing this crime? And, and in that sense, the, uh, all the people that work in an enterprise are responsible for the results. And the results have to be described. I, I use the, the usual uh, representation of the results of work that's common in the economics literature, and that is where you have positive and negative, that you don't create the product ex nihilo. You have to use up inputs, and you produce an output. So the net results, or the total res whole results, shall we say, uh, production are that the people that work in the firm use up the inputs and in the process of doing so, they produce the output. So the description of their results is what is, has traditionally been called the whole product and, and uh, what is in the economics literature is typically called the production vector or the production vector means it's got all these different components. And uh, the, the actual property rights that the descriptions of the capitalist enterprise are so steeped in metaphor that you have to sort of pause and say, well, what are the actual property rights that people have? And the actual property rights in the uh, human rental firm, the traditionally um, misnamed the capitalist firm, um, are that the employer owns 100% of the, uh, both the negative results and the positive results. Owning the negative results means you've got to pay off those liabilities because you have liabilities and assets expenses and revenues in accounting terms. And therefore, the employer gets the claim on also what is produced and then sells it to get the revenue. So the employees have 0% liabilities against them for whatever they use up in the course of production and have 0% of ownership claim on the output. So their role is exactly the role of a rented thing, as if you were renting a car or house. The, the car or the house can have no uh, from the legal point of view, no responsibility for the result, positive or negative, and that's exactly the role that the employees have uh, in the firm in, in terms of the actual property rights. The, the, of course, the metaphor is that the workers get a share of the product and the, the employer gets a share of the product and the suppliers get a share, but that's not the actual property rights. Those are, those are metaphors meant to obfuscate the real issues. <clears throat> so uh, what is the uh, source of the critique here is 
First of all, I'll start with the notion of inalienable rights. And the idea is, when I, when I say the, the workers are uh, still de facto, in fact, responsible for the results of their labor, the fruits of their labor, even though they're under an employment contract, it means that people cannot give up that sort of responsibility by signing a contract or by any sort of voluntary act, that they are inexorably co-responsible for the results of their labor. And then to, to do a little bit of intellectual history, this is also the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, a revolution of far more impact than the Russian Revolution in broad sweep of history. And the whole notion of inalienable rights as it was developed uh, in the radical enlightenment, both in Scotland and in Holland, not to mention in Germany, uh, was based on the, the uh, notion of the inalienability of conscience. And the word conscience is used in this context not to mean that sort of inner voice, but basically your most fundamental beliefs in, in religion. And, and uh, the idea was that you should not, uh, and in fact you cannot, simply take over your views from the priest or from the pope, that you have to, as it were, uh, verify them yourself, and you, you have inexorably that responsibility for your beliefs. You cannot transfer that to somebody else, to the, to the, the, uh, the pope or, or your, uh, the priest. And that was what was called the inalienability of conscience and, and very often forgotten. But that was the theme that was then developed into a political doctrine by Spinoza, by Hutchinson, and, and by the uh, German Enlightenment as well. So that's just a little bit of uh, history. And the, the uh, factual inalienability of conscience, or in fact of any aspect that people have as persons, is something that's actually well known in the law, and, and uh, that you, you, uh, the law fully recognizes when the employee, or in fact the slave, as, as Ms. Fumi uh, Okaji pointed out yesterday, that the slave was always under this contradiction, that when the slave committed a crime, then the law fully recognized that they were responsible persons then, that they had this capacity to have something imputed to them, in German, this is called Zerechnenkeit, the capacity to have something imputed to you, and the people cannot voluntarily give that up. They, you can't like turn yourself into a thing, even though the law may have a contract that has that effect, which is exactly what the human rental contract does, and exactly what the, if you had a voluntary contract for slavery, would do the same thing. So uh, I put in this quote here from one of the American abolitionists, William Goodell, that the slave who is but a chattel on all other occasions with not one solitary attribute of personality accorded to him becomes a person whenever he is to be punished. So the, this is not like some discovery that I made that, that uh, people are always de facto responsible for the results of their actions when they're acting uh, in a normal way. And, and, um, and they, they, this is not something they can give up uh, voluntarily. So this is the fundamental insight behind the whole theory of inalienable rights. And you should notice immediately it has absolutely nothing to do with how they're treated or the wage rate or how much real income the slaves had or whether the slaves were beaten and all that. It was a theory that said that the contract to sell yourself into slavery, in other words to sell yourself all at once, is a bogus contract because it has the effect of turning you from the legal point of view into a thing, except when you commit crimes, but that that does not happen uh, in fact. So it, when you have a contract where the legal thing says one thing, but the facts are different, that's what's called a fraud. And so the, the contract, when it was validated for selling oneself into slavery, and it has been validated throughout human history until uh, the 19th century, it was in fact an institutionalized fraud. And my argument is exactly the same facts hold for the employment contract, the employer-employee contract, the human rental contract is exactly the same facts hold for the uh, de facto or factual inalienability of responsibility. And uh, the slide there gives you exactly this quote from the literature on the employment contract. All who participate in a crime with guilty intent are liable to punishment, a master and servant. Master and servant's the older language uh, for employer employee that was current in the, in the 19th century and uh, it was still used by uh, 
law books as sort of a, an anachronistic phrase. So this is a law book from the 1960s. A master and servant who so participate in crime are, are liable criminally, not because they're master and servant, but because they both jointly carried out a criminal venture and are both criminals. So in other words, uh, the, the, the sort of fraudulent contract to rent a human being is sort of set aside when you commit a crime and the law says, well, what were the facts? The facts are you're two responsible human beings, you cooperated together to commit this crime and you're both gonna be legally responsible for it. And so the major point of course is, well, what changes from those facts when you're not committing a crime? When, when instead of obeying the boss to rob a bank, you're obeying the boss to produce a widget or something else, the facts about responsibility are exactly the same. And, and uh, that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the point of the next two things, that the workers are not suddenly turned into machines or instruments when they don't commit crimes and don't suddenly burst into agency when they do commit crimes, they have agency the whole time that they are responsible beings. And uh, so the, the, it's the law that then changes because the law does not uh, intervene to hold a trial and to see what the facts actually were and it's just what the whole purpose of a trial is. And, and uh, the law says, well, the, the employer has paid all the cost of the enterprise as, as it were appropriated the negative product and therefore the, the employer can appropriate the positive product so the employer ends up appropriating the whole product, whereas in fact the, the antecedents to this argument I'm giving, which is called the labor theory of property, is that labor in the sense of all the people that work in the enterprise should have the, the right to the legal right to the whole product, this negative as well as the positive. And, and um, so you have this uh, fundamental violation of, of uh, their rights uh, in production even though it's the result of a voluntary contract, as you, as you would in slavery if, if it were in fact established in a, in a voluntary way. So uh, where are the roots of this history? I'll, I'll get around to criticizing Marx in a minute, but uh, if you go back to the uh, origins of social democracy in Europe, there's a lot of uh, envy now on, on the European left that, that uh, we want to be like a Nordic social democracy or something. But uh, if you go back to the roots of even Nordic Scandinavian social democracy, go back to Ernst uh, Wigfors, who, who was the, one of the founders of the Swedish uh, social democratic movement, he had a much more radical analysis than actually uh, survived in the programs of Swedish social democracy. And, and if you read the quote there, you'll see he has exactly the same critique of the employment contract, that the human labor cannot be separated from the worker that you cannot, you know, when you, when you rent a, a, a car, if I own a car and I rent it to somebody, I can turn it over to them and they can use it independently of me. If I own a, a wrench, I can rent it to someone and I can turn it over and they can use it independently of me, but I cannot do the same with myself. So the whole idea that labor responsible human actions can be bought and sold uh, is in fact a, a legal fiction, a, a fraudulent uh, contract and uh, Vigfors said this, this is in 1923, and, and one of his, uh, uh, yeah, there was a Vigfors Commission on Industrial Democracy in 1923, and you can read it there yourself, but uh, he clearly uh, had this analysis. And uh, we'll get in a minute as to why has this analysis been forgotten uh, on the left. Another example of this uh, in annual bill, the argument is, is a more recent a uh, person, a good friend, uh, Carol Pateman, who makes exactly these same arguments, uh, both from a uh, point of view about the employment contract and from a point of view about feminism, where the relevant contract is the coverture marriage contract, which was the marriage contract up to the early 20th century in most of the Western countries, still is, of course, in, in uh, much of the Middle East. And, and uh, Carol, uh, Makes, makes exactly the same argument in her feminist classic book, The Sexual Contract. <clears throat> the answer to the question of how property in the person, in other words, human labor, can be contracted out is that no such procedure is possible. Labor power, capacities, or services cannot be separated from the person of the worker like pieces of property. 
She's not saying wages are too low, workers are exploited, they're overworked, they can't go to the bathroom very often. She not, has nothing to do with it. It's a fact about human labor that, that the person cannot turn themselves into an instrument, a tool, simply by in any way, shape, or form to satisfy this contract, which has exactly that effect. So it's a much deeper critique than the left is, is used to seeing, and it's been there all along. It was there in Vigfors, it's here in Carol Pateman, and uh, you know I've been saying it for 40 years as well. So that's the history that I want to now uh, look at why is the left so screwed up. And um, the, the uh, one way to see how screwed up the left is, is to go back and read some of John Stuart Mill, writing in the middle of the 19th century, in eight, 1848, for example. And uh, you, there's a lot of things in Mill you can criticize, of course, his, his colonialism, work for the India office, and so forth. But uh, he made it quite clear that the famous passage in, in his Principles of Political Economy in 1848, that if, if humanity is going to continue to improve, that the, the form of industry that will prevail in the end is labor hiring capital, labor electing management, and labor uh, being the members of the firm. In other words, what today we would call a worker cooperative or a, a uh, worker-owned firm, workplace democracy. And to say that, I mean, try to find an economist, a standard economist today who would say that, that, that if, if uh, even Bernie Sanders couldn't bring himself to say it. And, and uh, this is in 1848. So what happened between 1848 and now that the left lost track of this whole line of argument? And of course, the answer is Marx, Lenin, and the Russian Revolution. So uh, the, the uh, which completely, and uh, in, in, this is sort of my basic thesis here, is, is that they set back the left a century, a century, essentially a century, or a century and a half. And, and that, so we are just now beginning to come out of this, this uh, uh, time in which, in which Marxist-Leninism provided the alternative and thus gave capitalism a free ride and beginning to recreate the arguments that have been there all along that are not, have nothing to do with the Marxist critique or the supposed uh, superiority of uh, what was created in the, in the Russian Revolution. So the debate is not about whether workers should be employed privately or publicly. I, you can make a joke, this is sort of like a, the Cold War was like the Peloponnesian War between Sparta, which had publicly owned slaves, the Helots, and Athens, which had privately owned slaves. And, uh, and so the, that's been what the debate has been for the last century, the century that we're here to commemorate and certainly not to celebrate. And, and uh, that has given the, the uh, defenders of capitalism this sort of free ride by saying, well, that's the alternative, is, is just everybody's working for the state and, and, and instead of being privately employed. So uh, Marx didn't get anywhere near that. And uh, the, to put it bluntly, Marx had no theory of inalienable rights. So he had no ability to criticize the, the contract to rent a human being per se. He had to criticize the terms of the contract this is not to say that he wasn't in favor of abolishing wage labor, of course he was. But I'm saying, what was his theory? It takes a theory to kill a theory. And, and uh, he had no theory of inalienable rights. In fact, he ridiculed inalienable rights in, in various points uh, in, his, in his writings. And uh, he had no theory of property. He had no labor theory of property. And, and uh, other people at the same time, of course, did. Uh, people like Proudhon, people like Thomas Hodgkin uh, in England uh, developed that theory. And, of course, Marx had no theory of democracy, uh, that then, and uh, not to mention democracy in the, in the workplace. So just to focus on one of those points, that Marx had no theory to criticize wage labor per se, as opposed to simply saying the workers aren't paid enough. I give a quote here where, from Marx uh, where he's talking about the difference between the normal working day and overtime. And uh, he wants to say uh, that if, even if people are not exploited during the normal uh, working time, whatever that was, they could still be exploited in overtime. And so you can read the quote yourself, but the key part, the emphasis I've added there is that they would still be exploited uh, in overtime uh, 
even if the, the labor during the normal day was paid its full value. So if you're talking about labor paid its full value, your, your, your theory of exploitation just goes out the window because it means you're not arguing for the abolition of wage labor, you're arguing for paying it for its full value. And that's what's called superficial. That's a superficial theory. That if you paid workers more, and presumably when they're working for the state, they would be paid more, then that's not a critique of wage labor per se. So it's not a matter of, of oh, Marx is too radical. No, Marx is too superficial. And in American slang, we would say that Marx brought a knife to a gunfight. In other words, he, he tried to uh, develop the labor theory of value and uh, ultimately failed. Even if it had been a good theory of value and exploitation, it would have only been that and not a critique of, of the whole uh, system of wage labor, which is part of the system of property and contracts. You've got to know how to analyze a contract which is what the abolitionist movement did, which is what the feminist movement did vis-a-vis -vis the coverture marriage contract, and Marx had none of that. So he brought a value theory to a property theory fight and uh, thus was inherently uh, failing. And, but let me, let me say uh, uh, that, that this is in a sense a compliment to Marx because um, the, the, there's a, this is sort of a digression. The German, famous German physicist at the turn of the early 20th century, Wolfgang Pauli, was known for his acerbic tongue. And, and he was one of the developers in the early 20th century of quantum theory, which was a huge uh, intellectual mess, and it still is. People don't know how to interpret it. So uh, people would give Pauli their papers uh, to, to, for his comment. And, uh, he would look at them and he would say, well, this is wrong or this is wrong, but then some of the papers he would just throw and he said, this is not even wrong. So uh, that phrase has caught on and most of uh, theory of the left, I would have to classify as not even wrong, whereas Marx was wrong. Marx was a great theorist in a mind that just blew out all the other people like Proudhon and Thomas Hodgkin and others who weren't any, had it nowhere near his systematic uh, ability to theorize. So when I say he's wrong, that's a compliment. That, that's saying that, that uh, uh, he was able to develop a theory that was coherent enough and uh, the mathematics to develop it as a mathematical theory was not there in the 19th century, it was developed in the 20th century and, and the Marxian labor theory of value and exploitation was eventually formulated mathematically by Okoshio and Morishima and, and then one could see very clearly how superficial it in fact was. But that's not the worst of Marx's mistakes. That's where Marx, somebody had to develop the labor theory of value to see if it had the potential because when Marx lived, you know, he had that from Ricardo. And, and so let's see if he, and Marx did and he failed, but, but so he was wrong, but he was uh, much better than being not even wrong. Where Marx really got it wrong was the whole analysis of private property. And, and uh, there, uh, one has to go back to see what was the origin of his idea of private property. And, and there you have to go back to the Middle Ages. And, and uh, uh, the Middle Ages were not happy peasants working on the commons. The Middle Ages had a thing called feudalism. And feudalism was where the, the control of the uh, people living on land and working on land was all part and parcel of ownership of the land. So what today we call the landlord was in that day called the lord of the land. And it was all tied together so, so that the, the, if you lived on the Lord's land, uh, he owned the fruits of your labor. Uh, he was your, your political governor as well. And so all these things were tied together uh, in the ownership of land. And this is all quite clear, for example, in Otto von Gierke, the great German legal historian, as well as in Maitland or other, other legal historians about the Middle Ages. Marx made a huge mistake. He just substituted capital for land. He thought that, that, that all that was attached to capital and that's sort of this Marx's notion of capital. So therefore, if you want to condemn the capitalist production, he, he thought you had to eliminate private property. And that gave the capitalist system this incredible century long free ride to be able to pose as, as the defenders of private property when in fact the whole capitalist system is based upon appropriating the fruits of the labor, positive and negative, of workers, the very basis for private property appropriation, the only legitimate basis that's ever been proposed is getting the fruits of your labor. 
which doesn't apply to land, because land is not the fruits of anybody's labor, it doesn't apply to natural resources, but it does apply to the products of labor. And, and by condemning Marx through this mistaken analysis of, 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 of capitalist production, thinking that capital was just gonna be substituted for land, that, that uh, uh, he had to condemn private property. And uh, so the, the, uh, the employers, the so-called capitalists, are, are allowed then to, to uh, appear in history as, as the defenders of private, and this is like, uh, I think I have a slide here on this, it's like uh, people who, the whole system is to violate human rights to be allowed to pose as the defenders of human rights. And, and uh, so the, the, uh, the, the point here is, is that this is what is allowed this century and a half of the left to be wasted and, and for things that John Stuart Mill said to still sound radical today is because we gave it a free ride by the Marxian analysis that said, you know, we have to abolish private property and, and uh, substitute a system for everybody working for the government or society as institutionalized in the government. And uh, that's the alternative to being uh, privately employed. So uh, the approach that uh, we are trying to uh, propose now is how to reconstruct the narrative on the left that's entirely free of this past so that we don't continue to be pushed into this role of having to say, well, you know, Marx made a few mistakes or Lenin made a few mistakes or, or uh, gee, we're sorry that once you combine economic and political power that the most murderous psychopath like Stalin will get control and we won't do that. No, we, we have to completely change that narrative, which means going back into the history of Western thought, going back into the abolitionist movement, going back into the democratic movement, the feminist movement, to reconstruct these arguments, inalienable rights arguments, labor theory of property arguments, democratic theory arguments for democracy in the workplace, and to rebuild the left on that basis. So that means uh, the argument for the abolition of renting people based in the, in the name of inalienable rights and in the name of private property, which would be very difficult for most of my left-wing friends to, to say, uh, switch around like that and say, well, it's in fact in the name of private property that we have to abolish uh, the capitalist production, something that Proudhon said for a long time. When Proudhon said that property is theft, he of course meant the old system, and he talked about property once purged by justice, and of course for democracy in the workplace. So. The alternative is where you uh, don't have any institution for renting human beings, just as we don't have any institution today for owning other human beings, or we don't have any institution today for the coveture marriage contract by which women give up their independent legal personality in a marriage. Though all those contracts have been abolished, and uh, the argument here, what's called neo-abolitionism, is to abolish uh, the rental contract, that means that all the people that work in a economic enterprise would not only have the de facto responsibility for the positive and negative results, but would have the legal responsibility as well. They would be the members. The, the appropriations is of course joint in the enterprise, but they would be the legal members of that legal entity. And uh, just to give you an example of a totally non-Marxist, this, this is a, a, a Tory uh, minister of education and, and uh, when do people think about different social systems is, is after wars, when you have to reconstruct after wars. And so in 1944, Lord Eustace Percy, who was a, the Tory, uh, he was a writer and, and minister of education, said here is the most urgent challenge to political invention ever offered to the jurist or the statesman. The human association, which in fact produces and distributes wealth, the association of workers, managers, technicians, and directors is not an association recognized by law. So this is the group that I was talking about, the group of people working in an enterprise who in fact have that de facto responsibility. That association is not even recognized by law, as Percy points out. <clears throat> the law, the association which the law does recognize, the association of shareholders, creditors, and directors is incapable of production. So far from people getting the, produce, the products of their labor, this, the association is in fact recognized as the firm, the, the corporation, 
is not even capable of production, the, the people that are considered the members or the owners of the corporation. And the law does not, is not even expected by the law to perform these, these uh, functions. We have to give law to the real association and withdraw you know, this privilege from the imaginary one. So here's a Tory. Now, in 1944, laying it out. And, and, and uh, so why is all this, what I gave you before from Vigforce, why I g gave you from this Tory thinker, why is all this swept away? Well, I said it before, that the, the left has been set back at least a century by Marx, Lenin, and the Russian Revolution. And we're trying now to uh, dig out of that hole and create a new future uh, for the left. So the alternative is when this association of people who work in the firm are, when it, that's recognized, then labor will be hiring capital instead of the owners of capital renting people. <clears throat> and, and then the people would get the positive and negative fruits of the labor as the labor theory of property. The firm would be a democratic uh, community. It would not have owners, it would have members and, and uh, would be members by virtue of the fact that they work there. And uh, one of the best examples of that today uh, is the Mondragon cooperatives that people may have heard about, which are very real, and as any real human institution have, are full of flaws, but they're one of the best things around uh, to represent uh, these ideas, and, and uh, that this vision of uh, abolishing wage labor in favor of the cooperative commonwealth, this is the 19th century, uh, the labor movement in the 19th century had this this goal before uh, the, the rise of just the ordinary business unions that said we will accept wage labor and just try to collectively bargain for more and more and more within that, coupled with the, the whole Russian Revolution, and uh, which sidetracked the left uh, for over a century. So the book mentioned uh, by Michael before, uh, this is on my website, uh, it was published back in 1992 and the publisher disowned it within two years and wouldn't even put it in the catalog. So I demanded the rights back and got them back. So it's on my website and the website is right there. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, David Ellerman. I will present the next speaker, I'm very glad that Raoul Selig has also accepted the invitation to this debate of today. Uh, Raoul Selig is uh, an author, political scientist, translator and journalist. Until 2013 he worked as associated professor of political science at the National University of Colombia in Medellin. He currently holds a visiting professorship for international policy politics at the University of Kassel in Germany. Um, since 2009, uh, Raoul Selig has been conducting research on several issue, uh, aspects of post-capitalist transformation and has published, uh, among others, the books Vermessung der Utopie, Surveying Utopia, together with Elmar Altvater, 2009, Nach dem Kapitalismus, After Capitalism, VSA Verlag, zwei, uh, 2011. Andere mögliche Welten, Other Possible Words, together with uh, Aaron Taus, erschienen, uh, published in 2013, sorry. And Im Multiversum des Kapitals, in the multi Multiverse of Capital, uh, last year, 2016. In addition to his uh, sep uh, broad uh, theoretical, journalistical and political science work, Raoul Selig has also written a series of novels including The Bewaffnete Freund, The Armed Friend, uh, 2007, and Der Eindringling, The Invader, uh, 2012. The talk that we are going um, to hear and discuss afterwards is, uh, carries the title Rethinking Communism After Communism. And the talk will deal the question with uh, capitalism one sees today for the first time in the history of humankind, the establishment of a true world system. All life worlds are colonized and there is no more outside. 
But the success of this system, as everybody can see, uh, it's it, namely its immense dynamism has become a trap, as everybody can see. In the search for socially and ecological acceptable, sustainable alternatives that we discussed this morning, we cannot avoid the question of public property. For few things stand in the way of democratic transformation as much as the large question of private ownership of corporations and funds. As long as the power and the interests of a few capitalists are greater than the interests of the multitude, neither social justice nor a genuine democratization or the necessary ecological transformations are possible. In this regard, um, just uh, and then I close this uh, introduction. In this regard, the old communist thesis is as correct as it was in the 19th century. The strengthening of common ownership of the means of production is a necessary precondition for the social solution of the great problems of our time. And of course, Raoul Selig will develop this question not in the sense of uh, this kind of old uh, orthodox Marxist idea of state ownership, but in terms of the uh, more precise question of what would socialization uh, and uh, democratic owned uh, corporations might mean for us today. Thank you very much. I give the word to Raoul Selig. Yeah, I, I will stay here, so. Stay here? Yeah, I will stay here. That's good. Okay, uh, I feel uh, quite uh, limited in, in my English, so I will uh, read the paper. And uh, well, as I uh, didn't know what the others uh, would tell us in the morning, so perhaps some ideas will repeat what we heard before. But uh, anyway, I think we can uh, well, um, enter the discussion afterwards and see uh, if we really agree or if there are still contradictions between what we said before and what I am telling now. Well, my, uh, I, well, my uh, issue is uh, to defend the idea of communism. Of course, uh, I agree with a lot of uh, points that we heard, but anyway, I think that the concept of communism is um, still important for us. And I want to explain uh, that this, for sure, this will, certainly this will sound quite strange, 100 years after the Russian Revolution, 80 years after Stalinist purges, and 30 years after the socio-economic collapse of the Soviet Union, this idea might sound very strange, but I would like to explain what I mean with this. And uh, these are 11 points, 11 theses. My first assumption is that, and I think th this is where we totally agree, everybody, here, that we need um, systemic alternatives uh, more than, than ever. Yeah, I am, the global situation of social, ecological, and economic terms is alarming, and the world is in, in disarray. Uh, just um, to mention the wars like Syria, state failure in broad parts of the global south, um, spread, spreading of racism, right-wing ideologies, so social inequality, mass migration, climate change, arms race, slavery, trafficking in human beings uh, for forced prostitution, and so on. I certainly don't want to follow the bad leftist tradition that blames capitalism for everything, even cold weather, <coughs> But nevertheless, it seems clear to me that these crises of our times cannot be seen separate, separately. For the first time in human history, we really live in a world system. We heard this idea before, a system that has internalized all global spaces and societies. And in that context, I would argue that uh, capitalism is entering its decline just because of its total victory. In fact, capitalism has defeated all other social forms, both traditional and socialist ones. It had forced all human beings and societies under its conditions, but is now unable to offer place to them. Just look to the mega cities of the global south. We are talking a lot about immigration to the north, but real mass migration is directed to mega cities like Kinshasa, Nairobi, Bogota, Delhi, Jakarta, Lima, or Cairo. This migration comes as a direct result of the success of our economic world system. Capitalism is removing the last frontiers, particularly by intensifying the capitalization of rural areas. The problem is a third of the world's population still lives off agriculture, 2.5 billion people. 
These small peasants are currently losing their sources of income because they cannot compete with the industrialized farming of world market agriculture. As a consequence, they will have to move to the megacity slums over the coming years. Uh, this is also an idea of uh, Mike Davis' book, um, Planet, Planet of Slums. Therefore, the problem is not that the societies of the South haven't reached liberal capitalism yet, as claimed by modernization theory. In the real existing world of global capitalist markets, mega slums are the dominant expression of modernity. A growing 30, 50, 60 percent of world's population would just become economically superfluous in the next decades. And this is an idea we heard this morning also from Habermann and Hartmann. And uh, here we are not yet talking about the effects of automation in industries and services. So the first idea, I think, is not so controversial. Second idea. When the old dies, you would normally watch out for alternatives. The Spanish sociologist Cesar Rendueles defended in one of his essays that this search for alternatives shouldn't at all be considered utopian. On the contrary, Renrellis reminds us it was liberalism that imposed an extremely utopian project to society from the 18th century on. Liberal thinkers such as Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham strove after the substitution of sticky social commitments, obligations, and relationships by a totally flexible and anonymous mechanism, the market. In this context, it is also worth to remember Karl Polanyi. According to the Hungarian economist, the liberation of the market forces, the disembedding of the market, in Polanyi's words, destroys the foundations of our existence. That means society and nature. Solid relationships of mutual care are indispensable conditions for human life. For a third of our presence on Earth, we depend on stable relationships of care. But the dominant social structures based on a super dynamic market mechanism and driven by the law of accumulation are dismantling those relationships. In other words, market competition and accumulation are simply not the appropriate instruments to confront the problems of the global present. The growing social inequality, tensions between nations, environmental destruction, and so on. Third idea, that's the point where communism comes in. Of course, common property, or the overcome of private property, perhaps, would be more correct, as we heard this morning of Friederike Habermann. It's about use and not about property. But anyway, I will use the concept common property for a moment. Of course, common property of the means of production huge industries and infrastructure is no magic formula that makes all problems disappear in one swoop. Even the most utopian communists will have to admit that more efforts than socialization of means of production have to be made to end ethnic wars, for instance. But originally, the argument said something different. It, claim, it didn't claim that property, common property, is the solution but that is a decisive lever, hebel, for social change. Why that? Because only through the socialization of the means of production, the power of conscious decision returns to society. In other words, it's an indispensable condition for the political regulation of economic problems and, that's very important, for democratization. Four. The latter might sound very strange after the extremely authoritarian experiences with socialist countries that certainly were no democratic lighthouses, nor did they give power to society. Nevertheless, it's absolutely, it absolutely stays true that highly concentrated private property of means of production impedes democratic deliberation on so societal problems. I think we all uh, fear the frustration caused by the unlimited power of transnational companies, for example, and we all observe that global market com uh, competition constitutes the biggest obstacle today for the fighting against missing health care, for instance. 
as long as profit interests of the few weigh more than the common interests of the many, there are no possible solutions for the problem of majorities. So, as I said before, it's, um, common property is a lever, a lever uh, so that the interests of the many uh, weigh more. Yeah? Fifth idea. Um, th I, that's an idea that we also heard this morning, but anyway, I think uh, it's important to repeat it. There's another, another reason why we should discuss about the com benefits of common property. Uh, and the reason is that the liberal th thesis claiming the inefficiency of common property has been proven wrong in the last years. As you know, uh, I imagine, liberal dogma confirms that common property is inefficient because people don't care for common goods and won't commit themselves in lack of material incentives. So you won't work if you don't have uh, income, person, personal income or in other material incentives. However, research on traditional commons conducted for Elena Ostrom, for example, the Nobel Laureate for Economics in 2009, clearly showed that communities can care very well for common resources and goods as long as there are solid communities that feel responsible for those resources, as long as the individuals participate in the elaboration or modification of rules, so there's an element of democracy, and as long as there are mechanisms of mutual control in this community. So common use of forests, water, land, and even means of production are perfectly feasible. Furthermore, we have the practice of the P2P communities there, or P2P production, that means peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, which uh, prove that free association of producers, as Mark said, uh, exist in real life. What are these P2P communities? Uh, you all, I think, know them because they are these uh, software networks, uh, or open software networks uh, that developed uh, programs like Linux or Firefox or Wiki Wikipedia. Uh, because these, the interesting element in these communities is that they work without material incentives, without remuneration, and without property rights. Uh, so, well, I don't uh, believe at all that these P2P experiences can be reproduced easily in other contexts. However, I think that they show that self-organized communities based on common use, democratic deliberation, and cooperation work and can be more efficient than private companies founded on individual interests of profit. And in some way, I would say the same thing about the cooperatives, the existing cooperatives like Mondragon Co uh, Cooperative, that they show that there can be other forms of cooperation with all the critique uh, that is ne necessary to these experiences. Well, sixth idea. But which are the problems now of common property, and especially the problem of communism as we knew it in the 20th century? In the socialist countries, the nationalization of property led to an expansion of state bureaucracy that started to pursue their particular interests and logics. And it's very interesting that the left never developed a real materialist analysis of these interests. So there was materialism to criticize capitalism, but not sufficient materialism to analyze what socialism, socialism was about. Uh, sometimes the end um, of these state bureaucracies was to ensure material privilege as a kind of class, and sometimes it was just about uh, reconfirming the ruling mission of the party or the symbolic power of a leading group. But anyway, the concentration of power in the state prevented democratization and uh, societal deliberation. Against this background, Eric Owen writes, an US American uh, sociologist, proposes to rebuild socialist strategies focused on societal empowerment. Um, I find the argumentation of right in, in some aspect very naive, but anyway, the, I, I like the argumentation because it's interesting, the models he, I, I find them very, um, well, yeah, convincing in the sense how, it, how to explain pr uh, problems. That's the way I want to use him. Uh, when I say I, I find some arguments very naive, it's because I think that there's no analysis of uh, power relationships. But anyway, to that point, we could come afterwards. Uh, what does he say um, about uh, these societal empowerment? He il il illustrates the problem 
uh, um, using a simple triangle model formed by capital, state, and society. In that model, capitalism is equivalent to the empowerment of the economy at the expa expense of state and society. And uh, state socialism is the enforcement of the state at the expense uh, of economy or capital and society. And the third uh, alternative would be what I would call socialism of the 21st century. Uh, uh, that, uh, that, that would be a project in which society is empowered, confronting both state and capital. And now, obviously, this uh, model is very insufficient because um, society is an empty signifier, completely vague concept. When we say society, what do we mean? Are we talking about workers' council or about the Catholic Church? Are we talking of feminist organizations or of the Ku Klux Klan? For that reason, the challenge is not just about social empowerment, but about a certain transformation of society, too. But what kind of transformation do we need? From my point of view, in spite of all postmodern confusion, we perfect, perfectly know what we are referring to when talking about emancipation or social progress. And I think we, we would perfectly agree in this room that, for example, solidarity, democracy, horizontalization of power, uh, social and gender equality, freedom of decision, and so forth, are expressions or criteria of progress, of social progress. Uh, why do we think that these are the objectives to pursue? I think possibly uh, they are ethically founded, and uh, it will be quite uh, difficult to derive them theor theoretically. I think we come to some kind of ethic values, principles. Uh, but what seems very clear to me is that all this progress that we can observe in the 19th and 20th century uh, was the result of social struggles. I think in this point it's, it's very clear. And so to uh, yeah, explain, in pocket, uh, explain a little bit the ideas, it's not, it was not liberal political theory that gave, for example, universal suffrage to workers and women or civil rights to black people. All reforms and improvements of our lives were answers to the social mobilizations and demands of the many. And for that reason, we should ponder on strategies from below. In that sense, I would defend a double change of perspectives in the communist project. And this perhaps might be a new idea for us today. Indifference, but anyway, I think it is linked to many of the arguments we heard before. Indifference to the socialist politics of the 20th century, society instead of the state has to be the strategic core of the project. Meanwhile, all Leninist and social democratic theories revolve around the conquest and defense of state power. We have to focus on the construction of, social, of a social process of empowerment and, uh, and structures of people's power, understanding people as a class concept and not uh, as an ethnic concept. At the same at the same time, a communist strategy of the 21st century has to overcome the messianic imaginary according to which socialization is a single event and not a long-term process in which power becomes horizontalized uh, and uh, responsibility is shared. And that's an, uh, the reason why I think that cooperatives are so important also because they are forms how to, uh, yeah, how to democratize, democratize um, real economic relationships yeah, and to apply or to, to, yeah, to, to make real uh, socialization in a context that is still capitalist. Um, okay, in that sense, I would argue that we need an anarchist, revolutionary, reformist concept of changing society from below, always taking the perspective of the subalterns. From that point of view, it is totally clear that all kinds of gradual improvements of our lives are desire desirable, as it is equally clear that the question which government implements those changes is irrelevant for us. 
The degree of subaltern empowerment has to be measured by improvements, not by the configuration of governments. And this, I think, is very important because all the left discussion that I know, at least, is about who is in government, who can come into government, and not about what are the strategic goals that we have to build if we want to empower the subalterns in our society today. Uh, seven, David Harvey, British Marxist based in New York, proposes that we should discuss post-capitalist transition to communism, considering the emergence of capitalism within feudal societies. Capitalism was not introduced, as you know, by a movement or by a thinker uh, or by a political party, but was a result of different momentums that formed a new contingent social fabric. What kind of uh, momentums? He mentions, for example, new means of production, the opening of a global space, utilitarian <coughs> concepts of nature, the enlightenment, the bourgeois family and new forms of social production, the upcoming of the modern state, and many different fields, uh, changes in, in society, and all this combined gave birth to a new contingent social structure, a process which lasted uh, several centuries. And uh, Harvey says that post-capitalism transition uh, must be conceived in a similar way, yeah? as a long-term project of social struggles and struggles and emancipatory transformations or changes in every area of our life, of our lives. Eight. Uh, Bob Mason and uh, accelerationist thinkers such as Alex Williams and Nick Zrinijek have come back to the quite traditional idea in the last years, that social progress will be driven by technological development. I don't know if you read these books. They are interesting, but anyway, I would say very limited in their argumentation. But I would uh, uh, indeed say that uh, some of their arguments are strong. They defend that technological advance helps us, helps us in three manners. First, it increases material wealth while reducing profits because automation, automation is cutting the added value, which is the source of the accumulation of uh, capital. I think this is a very similar idea to what you referred, Ferik, about uh, Jeremy Rifkin, no? What's his name? Grenznutzen. How do you call that? that? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. The second idea is. Um, uh, automation liberates us from manual work. This is the traditional idea. And third, uh, automation is, converts cooperation into the most important production factor. And this is, in, for me, a very strong argument, very convincing argument. In a society where knowledge is becoming crucial to the production process, and all capitalist uh, theorists uh, say this, um, private property and market competition turn into obstacles, yeah? Uh, why do we have public libraries? Because uh, if we want to have a production of knowledge, uh, the best condition uh, for having, uh, well, this production of knowledge is sharing knowledge. So, ninth uh, thesis is, nevertheless, we should be skeptical about technological solutions for social contradictions. I think this is what Federica said this morning too. Technological advance always improves the conditions for domination and surveillance too. So I don't agree with Detlef that all kind of technological change implies domination. Uh, well, implies perhaps, uh, yes, but, but it, it, not all technological advance means only domination. There are different aspects in, in this uh, development. Um, but anyway, uh, for a reconstruction of social alternatives, we should have in mind two alternative approaches. First, we heard it, care ethics. In German, care is discussed regarding social reproduction in crashed nursing homes and hospitals. Uh, however, in Spanish, care is understood more like los cuidados, no? Aufeinander uh, geben. Well, in German discussion perhaps too, but I would... Uh, make uh, strong this, this point, yeah? that, that's is, is taking care of others, social relationships and environment. In that sense, care ethics are a moral philosophy that is not founded on free individuals and their behavior, as it had come in, of, in liberal thinking, but on social relationships, in interactive 
things. We need a moral philosophy that takes relationships as the basis of thinking. Um, I want, just wanted to mention that uh, there's a similar point uh, in the concept of summa causae, or when we were, as uh, some indigenous communities use it in Latin America. There, the good life is not equivalent to wealth. It means harmony with community and, and environment. And uh, that approach has fo part, formed part of the constitutions of, or became part of the constitutions of Ecuador and Bolivia in the uh, mid 2000s. I think. Uh, in the real life, the summa causae does not, not play a significant role in the, in the, uh, in the reality of the, of the two countries. But anyway, I think it's an interesting approach because it reminds us that we also have to question our way of life. And this would be a, a point, a linking point to what uh, Uli Brand said this morning. As human beings, we are constantly dedicated to producing desires at Deleuze, Guattari pointed out. But this desiring production is colonized by market logics and interests of profit. Therefore, we have to create a concrete utopian imaginary of what would or what could be our common good life instead of consumerism. I think this is very near to the idea of uh, criticizing the imperiale Lebensweise. Ten. Although I have vindicated a kind of anarchist dissociation from the state perfect a perspective, state and government remain crucial a crucial terrain of dispute. Why do I say this? Because uh, legal arrangement and bureaucratic structures configure the conditions of the social life of subalterns. At the same time, social struggles necessarily transform the state structure and force the latter to create offers of inclusion. In other words, even the most utopian anarchist will always act on the field of the state. And uh, following Foucault, we could ask if socialism failed because of its lack of gouvernementalité, the inability to create an institutional framework and techniques of governing that encourage practices of solidarity, care, shared responsibility, and radical democracy. Well, why do I insist in that? That idea might uh, sound very abstract, but I, I'm referring to a very uh, concrete experience. In Venezuela, I witnessed in the 2000s how the Chavista government called to build uh, co cooperatives, so the solidarity economy, how they, uh, how they called it also. And uh, really, uh, hundreds of thousands of cooperatives were founded in, in very few months. And the interesting thing what, was that they all had disappeared in only two years. And um, yeah, we all ask why could oh, we, we, uh, there was lit, very little discussion about the, this experience. No, the, we all were very uh, um, we had a lot, a lot of en enthusiasm about the um, the, con the building of these cooperatives, but there was no real analysis of what had happened to them. And I um, I think that uh, the error consisted in the fact that the state tried to command a process of social reorganization. But people's power can only come from the people, from the subalterns. And uh, however, this process of self-organization is not spontaneous either. either. If uh, the organized left has a task in human history, it's to encourage solidarity and empathy by their own practices and examples and to faci facilitate the construction of a different uh, of different social relationships. In other words, as the institutional arrangements constantly create incentives for a certain egoistic behavior, we must conquest different arrangements that uh, facilitate those alternative conducts. And that's the need why or even the most utopian anarchist has to think how to reconfigure uh, the institutional relationships and to reconfigure the state. So, 11, what is to be done, to use Lenin's words? As I mentioned before, we possess criteria for the definition of social progress and emancipation. From an emancipatory point of view, we should scrutinize all our political actions to find out whether they contribute to that process of subaltern empowerment, socialization, solidarity, and ecological change, for example, to mention only some elements. Uh, since there is a strong contradiction between the long-term character of that kind of transformation and the need of short-term 
and immediate mobilization of the many, we have to get rid of a central thesis of postmodern thinking. And uh, this is another linking point to what Uli said in the morning. I would also uh, affirm, affirm, yeah. affirm uh, that we do need grand narratives. We need a revolutionary narrative that appreciates these small conquests, like, for example, a uh, housing project uh, that socializes housing for 30 families. Yeah? Normally, we don't, we do, we all, or many of us are involved in those, those kind of projects, but we don't see them as a construction of people's power, of, of, a, of a subaltern power. And we have to, we have to build a revolutionary narrative that appreciates these conquests and visualizes the growth of subaltern power. And in this sen sense, I would say also that the problem of the 20th century social inclusion of the reformist movements was not that infrastructure came into public hands and that services were accessible for everyone, as it was in many social democratic countries. The problem was that our narratives interpreted these conquests as successes of reformist leaderships, while in fact they were materializations of subaltern power. In that sense, we have to rebuild the concept of social progress and to provide explanations of how our immediate acts contribute to transform societies and global structures on the long run. And uh, now I noticed uh, there were 12 theses, so the last thesis is 12th. When I discuss that uh, issue with all the comrades, because I'm a member of the staff of uh, the left party, and so sometimes I, I discuss with uh, comrades of 85 years that were still law, uh, taught in Leninist schools, and they always say the same thing, and I think it's very true. They say that uh, my thinking is very naive. Yeah? Um, the law of accumulation, they say, and the competition between uh, nationally organized com companies necessarily leads to armed conflicts. And so they say there's a necessary link uh, between capitalism and imperialist wars. Traditional idea, but very actual if we see the world situation of today. And uh, I really feel that it's not casual that arms race, economic protectionism, racism, and military menaces are incrementing. Uh, but I also w would argue that there is no possibility to stop these tendencies of violence by their own means. The, military, the militarist machines cannot be stopped by revolutionary violence, at least today. And I say this because I uh, lived quite a long time in Latin America, in Colombia, you know the armed struggle was a strategy for the revolutionary and even the reformist left for a long, long time, for about 50 years, and I think uh, it was proven even in, under these conditions that the revolutionary armed struggle uh, was not a strategy to change the conditions. Uh, when enmity, uh, enmity Feindschaft, when enmity becomes integrated in the governmental logics through the construction of a terrorist other, this is what happened in Colombia. Now we had an authoritarian right-wing government that used the existence of a guerrilla to reinforce themselves as uh, authoritarian power. If this happens, the only option for us is to refuse the, the spiral of violence in which we are condemned to be defeated. The only possible transformation, at least at the moment, seems to be a long-term process, but not as a marriage with the ruling classes and the state apparatus as the old social democracy propagated, and the communist parties do, but as a subversion of dominant structures and a conscious construction uh, of counterpower from below. So, bis hierher, thanks a lot. Thank you.